everybody. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to episode 60 of the Front Porch Book Club. <laughs> we always laugh because it's amazing. It is. <laughs> the Front Porch Book Club is a podcast that meets twice a month. We like to dig deep into the relationship between characters and the worlds they live in. Grab your book and iced tea and join us on the Front Porch. This month, we're discussing The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. And we have this most amazing expert who's going to be joining us on our front porch to discuss this book and the context of what is happening in Italy during this time. Her name is Dr. Deanna Shemek. Dr. Shimmick, or Deanna, as she invited us to call her, is a professor of European Languages and Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Her research interests include Italian literature, Italian and European history, women and gender studies, Renaissance and early modern studies, among a number of different areas. So you can see she is so deeply immersed in this world as a scholar. She directs IDEA, the Isabella de Este Archive. It's an online environment for study of the Italian Renaissance through the figure of Isabella de Esta, who lived from 1474 to 1539, Marchesa of the city-state of Mantua. Through IDEA, a team of collaborators from the U.S., Italy, Scotland, and Australia create research and learning tools to stimulate and facilitate learning, teaching, and research about the history, music, literature, art, and politics of early modern Italy. Deanna has authored a number of scholarly books and articles. She received her master's and Ph.D. in Italian studies from Johns Hopkins University. And her BA in English from where? The University of Nebraska Lincoln. So, of course, I will have to play the Nebraska game with her about where she's from. <laughs> well, I think listeners are going to be interested not only in this book, but she brings such wealth about the history and the culture of what is going on and how these people are responding to the environment in which they're active participants. So she just brings to life a lot of aspects of this book that I really didn't have the cultural context to understand. So let's get to our discussion, Nance. Let's get to it. Well, welcome, Deanna, to the front porch. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We are so delighted to have you join us. My first question has to be, how a small town Nebraska girl ended up becoming an Italian scholar. <laughs> I know it, it's not the expected thing, right? The story I tell has to do with my best friend in junior high and high school, who was the daughter of a, an Italian mother and a Dutch father. Her father was a plant pathologist at University of Nebraska. And she and I had this dream that we were going to graduate and then go to Italy and wander around. And none of that happened, but I did start taking Italian at night while I was still in high school. I was at Pius, and none of the high schools taught Italian at the time. Still don't, I'm sure. But I started then just for fun. And then when I got to University of Nebraska at Lincoln, I was going to do what everybody else did and take Spanish. But the Spanish classes were full. So I decided to take Italian and wow. it started there because I had a wonderful instructor who was an ABD graduate student at the time from Indiana. And um, she said, you have to study abroad. You have potential or something. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was, <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> I scraped together the loans and got my parents to agree and and I went off to Bologna for a year and studied at the university there through a program yeah. that also offered kind of booster classes and things. And then at that point, I just thought, I have to continue. I want this to be a part of me, and I want to be a part of this. And so then I returned home, spent a couple more years. I did five years undergrad because I felt like I hadn't read enough. And I was doing a degree in English. And uh, I started to read American literature, Plains literature, because the Italians were so interested in that. And I thought, I didn't know that was so important. 
I applied to graduate school in Italian and I got in. That year in Bologna, can you describe what that's like as a Lincoln girl living for a year in Bologna, Italy? It was utterly enchanting. It was a different time also in Italy because we're talking 1978, 79. We didn't have a TV because there weren't TVs in student apartments. We didn't have any media. We weren't really proficient enough to read the newspapers. So I didn't really realize, and the teachers weren't talking about this to us, but we could see that there were demonstrations. There was one day when tanks rolled through the downtown of Bologna. And what what I understood better only later was that Aldo Moro had just been assassinated. And this was the time of the Red Brigades. Yes. But that was pretty foggy for me. For me, it was a complete wonder and a liberation. It was incredibly strenuous for me. I don't know how I did that because I didn't have the proficiency when I got there really, but I developed it. I worked really hard and there wasn't mass tourism yet. So there weren't any Americans around really, uh, except for us. And we, my roommates and I insisted on living with an Italian student who became one of my best friends and we're still very much in contact. I spent lots of time in her home city of Trieste up in the north. So when I came back, it was very hard to adjust to just being back. I felt really bereft, yes. determined to get back there. And to kind of get that balance back it was a real labor of, wait, I do love where I live too. This yearning to be back there, to have that capacity, because when you learn another language, and you've probably done this, when you really learn it, you are another version of yourself. You're not somebody else, but I was the Diana in Italy, and different things come out of you. You have to speak differently. You have to formulate your thoughts differently. And I, I wanted to keep that, too. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was incredibly tiresome to people. People do this all the time when they come back from study abroad. They're always comparing and saying, well, in France, they do it like this, you know, or in Spain, <laughs> I would do that instead. And people are, leave me alone, bitch. <laughs> you know. Anyway, I managed to basically have my dream career, which requires me to speak Italian and to go to Italy and to discover more and more of it. And it's just been fantastic. And I'm sorry to say, I don't think Italian is taught at UNL anymore. That is a tragedy, really. I have to ask, what was the literature that Italians were interested in, the Great Plains or American literature? Did, were they familiar with Willa Cather, for instance? I came back and read, of course, Willa Cather and Mari Sandos, and mm -hmm. I had known some of John G. Neihart before. They were interested in Rolvag, I think, sort of the Plains pioneer experience, Really, they were encountering some of that stuff through movies. Okay. But they knew there was this literature. And I was kind of learning from them. And I thought, well, this is kind of dumb. The The professor there at the time was Paul Olson. Oh, yes. Yeah. So he taught the Plains Pioneer Experience. And I'd already taken a Chaucer class with him, which was his real, you know, but, but Plains literature was too. And it was, it was transformative. It was a real a gift, you know, that kind of the Italians gave me that because I wouldn't have picked that up. I would have been reading Henry James or something. Mm -hmm. Paul Olson, a towering figure at the University of Nebraska for many years. Yeah. Wonderful man. We're excited to have you and your background to talk about this book. Because when Nancy and I talked about it, it only took us so far and then we're like kind of blown away by her life and her experience. This poor girl, Lucrezia, this is an arranged marriage. She's expected to get a baby for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. She can't interrupt him. She has no power. She has to have sex when he wants to have sex. She can't put her own two cents into any of his decisions that he makes. She's basically got to keep her mouth shut. Mm -hmm. You've written extensively and created online resources about women ruling during the Italian Renaissance. Is her experience the norm for that time? That's a really good question. And so I, I tell you, I was, I was somewhat taken aback by the portrayal of that part of her experience, as I understand it, and as I, from my experience reading many, many letters and books about these women, 
First of all, there was a difference between the way that women interacted with the public and with their court and their city in the Florentine court and the way they were allowed to behave and act in the northern courts, okay. where Ferrara is. Florence sort of went back and forth between being a republic and a kind of principality. At the time of this novel, it's a duchy, so there's a grand duke. We hear plenty in the novel about Lucrezia's mother, Eleonora di Toledo, who was a fascinating figure. I actually consulted my colleague just this morning, Bruce Edelstein, who is a specialist of Eleonora di Toledo, an art historian, has a gorgeous book on her gardens, the Boboli Gardens, and asked him a little bit about this. He hadn't read the novel yet, so we, we can't confer about that yet. But Eleonora was a strong figure, as you can see. And I think by all accounts, the marriage that's depicted there is probably pretty pretty faithful to reality. But in general, the the women in the northern courts had much more freedom, much more autonomy. They were co-governors. They were brought into the business of the court. The great grandmother, I want to say, <laughs> of Alfonso, who is the mother of Isabella d'Este, whom I study, was one of these women who was very strong and in many cases did more active ruling than her husband did because he was very troubled by mental issues. But these women were trained for leadership hmm. and they sort of set the pace. They were trained, they were educated, they were meant to be articulate, politically minded, assertive leader persons who always deferred to their husbands. There was a hierarchy of power, but they were supposed to be very capable. And we, we have many examples of those. The Florentine situation was much different, and the Florentines thought this was kind of crazy. They kept their women, even the, the wives of the princes, much more inside. So I think that depiction of Lucrezia never having been outside and never having been allowed to roam, that's probably pretty accurate. But what I found striking was the depiction of Alfonso as somebody who doesn't want his wife to know anything. It seems to me that would have been a tremendous break with tradition. And I don't know if it's true or not, if he was just basically paranoid and tyrannical in that way, because it's always possible. It's also the case that this is the 1560s and we're already in a kind of much more, I don't know, guarded moment in all of the Italian courts. So it's possible, you know, that this is realistic, but I find it surprising. It, it was certainly striking in the novel. And I, I definitely want to find out more about her and about him. Yeah. And it seems he was especially pressured because of his mom and his sister wanting to go back to France and that whole Catholic mm -hmm. Protestant schism that was happening at the time. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, that had been going on for decades, basically since Luther and since before Luther. So, you know, that's like 1520s and we're decades later, but Ferrara was a little bit of a hotbed of Protestantism. And there were some charismatic preachers and theologians, if you will, except they didn't really, the Protestants didn't really appreciate the theology in, in the same way that the Catholics did. It was a very different scene, right? Yeah. So that's quite realistic. René de France, his mother was attracted to Protestantism and I actually don't know. I assume it's accurate that she went to France. This business about producing an heir is absolutely right. Mm. Every woman in this kind of position had to produce as many children as possible. And the more of them that were males, the better. But the, the females were also very important to the diplomatic tying together of the courts through marriage. The males were important because they could actually inherit rule and the females because they could create alliances. It, it's really interesting, this whole dynamic of his infertility. This happened. It was not uncommon. And that kind of pressure was very heavy on women. And I thought that the depiction in the novel was really great with that, at least from my perspective, from what I know, because... Lucrezia isn't surprised. Sometimes in novels like this, in order to kind of be with the reader, the novelist will say, 
oh, and then she discovered when she was married that she was expected to have babies and that that was her sole reason for being in the marriage. She understands that. She's not surprised by that. And she's kind of prepared. I thought the depiction of her level of knowing and unknowing about sexual intercourse and things was really beautifully handled. That struck home too with me with Isabella Deste because she, just by point of comparison, I don't find it personally in her correspondence, but my friend, another colleague who's done a different part of the correspondence with her mother does find it that Isabella Deste was terrified of basically initiating conjugal relations. And she tried to avoid it for as long as possible. (laughs) <laughs> and she succeeded for a while. I mean, she succeeded in avoiding and putting it off and trying to go home. And finally, her parents said, you can't keep coming home. You have to stay there. You have a job. You have to have children now. And so she acquiesced and she had to do it. But women did find ways to avoid, especially after they had had their children, they could avoid intercourse if they didn't want to have it. And in the case of Isabella Deste, and I'm telling you this because it was common, the men, many of them had syphilis. Oh. You did not want to have relations with this person if you didn't have to. They would pair up with prostitutes. They were out on the road a lot as soldier princes. They were free er- erotically to have whatever relationships they wanted. And that was normal but they did contract syphilis and often they gave it to their wives. Many people in his, well, Isabella's own husband had syphilis. Wow. She was able to avoid it and she lived to a ripe old age. It, you know, it was interesting how sort of pinned down literally Lucrezia is in the novel. I guess that's realistic. There must have been cases like that. And he is desperate. Alfonso really is desperate. And the Este line does die out. So does the Gonzaga line, dies out for lack of heirs. It's interesting that the responsibility for that is assumed to be entirely hers. The doctor never suggests that Alfonso may be the one that's having the problem in terms of fertility. Yeah, but other people do, right? Yes. Yeah. And the doctor surely knows. (laughs) He can put two and two together, but he can't say that. He'd like to keep his life, I think. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I think probably the whole town knows. (laughs) I think Alfonso's the only one who's clueless. And the way they know is because they know that he's had many other partners. And Mm -hmm. And most of these men had some what we today call natural children to avoid calling them bastards. Yeah. Most of them had these and they could fall back on them. Even Ferrara was ruled at one point by a half brother who was a natural child or so I think. Don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. So it, that those people could come in handy too, but he doesn't have any. Uh-uh. So everyone knows this. And then he has two other wives according to the epilogue and they don't have any children either. Yeah. Draw your own conclusions on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our book's title is The Marriage Portrait, and the book implies that marriage portraits for elite marriages were pretty common. What was the purpose and symbolism of a marriage portrait? Yeah. So that's another thing that this book handles a little bit surprisingly for me, because my understanding of marriage portraits is that they were often done, and actually Bruce Edelstein implicitly confirmed this in our brief exchange, They were generally done during the negotiations for the marriage, and they were tokens of promise, of affection. They were information media. People who were thinking about starting negotiations, they would always send emissaries to look the person over. Does she have a hunchback? Is she too short? Does it seem like there's going to be problems with procreation or that the children will be defective, right? That's That was the big concern. Also, they always wanted to know, is she attractive? Is it going to be a chore? Is it, What is it? How old is she really? Because sometimes these brides were far too old to marry and have children, even older than their husbands in some cases, because of the alliance that was being created. So things had to be negotiated. And in addition to sending somebody to go look them over and write back, they would often ask for a likeness. And that likeness would go back. Sometimes it was a childhood portrait. 
I was telling my husband about this marriage portrait and he said, yeah, they use them to inform people about what the bride looks like, even though she's only four. Right. <laughs> Sometimes the marriages were contracted when the bride and groom were young children and it was just a contract. So the portraits kept coming sometimes. And when there's a marriage portrait, remember when Lucrezia opens up that painting of the Martin, she expects it to be a marriage portrait. She expects it to be a portrait of Alfonso. And it's not. Right. But that's what they were for. So the fact that he devises a marriage portrait after they're married, it's not a marriage portrait anymore. Sometimes people had them done in profile, especially in the 15th century, and then they would put them together and have them facing each other in the palace once the marriage took place. Yes. You've seen images like that. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder how faithful these portraits were that were being sent back and forth to the actual appearance of the individual, or if they were photoshopped, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, they tried to sh show them in the best light. You'll remember from the novel that when Alfonso finally sees his bride in private and he sees how lovely she is, he compares that to the portrait that they got, which I did look up that portrait and it, it doesn't look like it's of a 14 year old to me, but I guess, I don't know. Anyways, I, I got to sort that out, that portrait by Bronzino. They also talk about it's a copy that he got. And that was often the case too. You have the master do the original, you keep that in the palace but it's valuable. So you have copies made and they circulate as a kind of coinage of the image. Mm. But in this case, we're told that she's more attractive than the portrait. And Leonello says this too. He says, oh, she looks better than that portrait. Just like you said, the portrait isn't so great. So you can tell they talked about the portrait, but they do discuss the kind of premium on a good likeness. And when the painter is painting Lucrezia the second time, and Alfonso is dictating how he should capture her, her spirit. I think that was very accurate. There was a fascination with the capacity of portraiture to capture the soul, the spirit of a person, as well as the likeness, the physical likeness. And often paintings are sent back. That hair's too dark. This doesn't look right. This isn't a good likeness. It's like, you've got me too fat or you've got me too thin. And these corrections are made because after all, that's it. There's no photography. Right. And it's interesting too that portraits often portrayed status or interest by what was around the subject. What were they holding? What was the painting in the background? What fabric were they wearing? And the marriage portrait talks a little bit about that as well. Yeah, it does. And it's interesting that, first of all, it's Jacopo who really paints it. Yes. It seems like he maybe has been the one also to arrange some of those objects because he understands who she is. But at least we are told that Alfonso hasn't objected, that there are paintbrushes and things. There is one historical error that I saw, not in the painting, but when Lucrezia sits down at one point to her desk and she's calming herself by looking at her stuff, she has a telescope on the desk. And that hasn't been invented yet. Oh, oh, good catch. Yeah. When was the telescope invented? What year was that? 1608. And not by Galileo. Galileo developed his in 1609. This takes place obviously in the 1560s. So it's not there yet. And she's got it. So you know, uh, Maggie O'Farrell <laughs> slipped up just, but you know, there's always one or two of these. Yes. Something else I thought was some artistic license, let's say. First of all, the letters interest me greatly because I read so many letters, right? The letters that say, my dear Alfonso or dearest Lucrezia, I've never in my life seen a letter from one noble to another, even among married people, even a mother to her child that doesn't address them as, you know, my most illustrious Lord. Oh, I'm not sure if she called him by his first name. The novel kind of piqued my curiosity. I assume first names were used at court among spouses, but even into the 19th century, I think there are people who refer to each other as my lady and not mm -hmm. by their first names at that rank. Mm -hmm. Maybe O'Farrell just thought 
I need to create a greater sense of immediacy. For me, that was just a little bit jarring to have this dearest Alphonse. And it, it's cute the way Lucrezia tries to figure out how should she address the note. Also, very few of these letters were written by the person who signs them. They were usually dictated to a secretary. But it is the case that if you didn't want somebody else to be reading it, you would try to write it yourself. How truthful would letters have been between royals at that time? Like the letters to her parents? Yeah. Was there a concern that letters would be read by people other than the person intended? And so there is shadowing and suggestion, or at that level, could you bear your soul, your thoughts, say the things that were really on your mind? No. Yeah. No. I, you know, I wanted to find letters like that. And, yeah. you know, I've read, I don't know, 30,000 or so of Isabella Deste's letters. And there's very little in them that is unguarded. When when there is a little less guardedness, it really you can really feel it. And the the reason is that there is the assumption that there is always an overhearing, overreading audience. Now they did write letters in cipher for that reason. And so mm. there's a whole system of cryptography that had developed among these courts for state security purposes. Actually, where you find more frankness is when the ladies in waiting write to each other or when they write to sometimes the young prince in the court and they'll tease him or they'll be playful with him. You can find it more in there and you, you know, you get the kind of like off color jokes, the more salacious things are in there. I looked in vain, really. I mean, you really have to know what you're reading to see that someone is deeply concerned and they voice it in ways that are always safe enough so that if this is discovered, it won't create more problems. Mm -hmm. I pick up on that a little bit in the book as she's thinking about how do I broach this with my parents? Mm -hmm. What is it that I can say about Alfonso? Yeah. Well, I want to check something else out with you too. Alfonso and his hunchman, they think they've beaten her to death. Yeah. Is there historical precedence for powerful men killing their wives at that time? There certainly is historical precedent for powerful men having their wives killed. And in fact, O'Farrell talks about a couple of those, the accounts of those that she used as some of her sources. Maybe if I thought about it long enough, I would be able to come up with one. But I think generally they preferred not to do it themselves. Mm. They had their hands in it, huh? Oh, sure. Wow. Different people get killed at court. Brothers get killed. The Borgias are famous for this. Lucrezia Borgia had a husband who was killed reputedly and probably by her brother, Cesare Borgia. Did he do it himself? No, he didn't do it himself. Even in the Ferrara court, they had plots against each other brothers in the generation that I study. There was a plot against the first Alfonso d'Este mm -hmm. by his brothers who wanted to take power from him. He discovered it. One of them was imprisoned for many decades and he was released as an old man. Wow. Yeah. They blind each other, these people. They gouge their eyes out. Oh, my. They cut off hands. They do all kinds of things. It was a really rough time. So killing your wife or having your wife killed, he would do it in order to get a new wife, I guess. But you could have a marriage annulled for a lack of offspring. At the court of Urbino, for example, again, in the generation that I study, which is like the 1520s, 30s, there was impotency and the Duke of Urbino in one generation never had children. And he was married to Isabella's sister-in-law. So this, these are all connected. And there was a lot of pressure on them to annul the marriage and for him to enter the priesthood. But the couple refused because they actually had a companion at marriage. And the Duchess famously said, I would rather live with this man as my brother than have any other husband in the world. Of course, they had to adopt a, a nephew as their son in order to pass the duchy on. Fascinating. 
Mm -hmm. During this book, Italy is governed by a patchwork of duchies that were seeking power over each other in other countries, such as Spain and France. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about these feudal states and the power structure in them? So Italy was basically at war for most of the 16th century, both among the different states and with alliances of states against foreign powers. And you have the consolidation of the Spanish and the Habsburgs. So you've got the Austro-Spanish consolidation. France is a, a monarchy at this point. It's a great threat. Venice is still a very powerful state. It's a republic. And these other states are all kind of in alliances. Florence plays this big role, all plays this big role also. Several of the popes come from the Medici family, a sort of right. string of them. So that's very important. They're all vying for power and trying to maintain their own identities, their own existence, actually. The novel doesn't thematize that too much. What's going on exactly in the 1560s, I think we're still looking at the Protestant threat. You also have the perceived and real Ottoman threat from the outside. So there's there's quite a lot at stake here. Most of the time, these princes in these small states are soldier princes. So they're off at war. They're captains in these alliance forces. Alfonso did fight for the French. Mm -hmm. That's just this common thing. And Ferrara was often Francophile, but there's this problem now with the Protestantism, et cetera, that is another kind of threat. So you've got the threat of the faiths. You've got the threat of these coalescing foreign powers that are becoming larger and larger. They're looking more like nation states. Mm -hmm. And see, this is another reason why these women had to be capable because the husband was a soldier prince. He was going to be away. So the wife had to actually know what was going on, had to be privy to the state security secrets, and had to be capable of running the court along with the court staff. And there were these figures sometimes like Leonello, the henchman, who were very jealous of their own proximity to the prince and often suspicious of the princess, the duchess, whoever it was, and this friction between them could emerge. And sometimes it dogged the relationship forever or until the death of the husband or the death of the henchman. Well, my goodness, I can't imagine a 16-year-old girl, and especially her, because she is very naive in some ways. She has basically lived in the nursery yeah. with her nanny. To hear you saying now that this woman should have been able to step into her role and be able to know about the culture, the people ruling, running the house. <laughs> she doesn't know a lot. Yeah, but she knows she doesn't know it because she's seen her mother. She has seen her mother who knows everything. And she tells Alfonso that. He says, I'm sure your father would never tell your mother these things. She says, no, on the contrary. He told her everything. She knew everything. She advised him. He valued her advice. And he says, oh, well, that's all very charming, you know, <laughs> but that's not the case here. I don't know how very similar that was in this case, but it was not the case in the prior generations in Ferrara. It couldn't be. And she was trained in some ways. We know that she, she studied Latin. She studied history. She studied probably rhetoric, Cicero, because they have to know how to write a persuasive letter. They functioned often as, as diplomats themselves, as ambassadors on brief trips to go and charm the prince that the husband was having trouble with or something. This role was very important, and it was quite odd to me to think of Lucrezia, even given what I've told you about how the Florentines and the, in the Republic in particular seem to have kept their women more close in and they didn't go out. They didn't even show themselves at the balcony, really. That seems different for Cosimo, Primo, and Eleonora di Toledo. As the novel narrates, they did have carriage rides and promenades and things like this where she would be seen. And that was probably right. I have to ask Bruce Edelstein about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in fact, her mother commissioned and, and had built the Boboli Gardens. She had farms. Mm -hmm. She managed land and staff and stuff. Lucrezia would have seen this. So 
she expected to be busier Mm -hmm. and to be brought in to these conversations. But without his sharing, yeah, she remains kind of trapped in a kind of infancy. Yeah, that's like the way you said that, because that's kind of what I was thinking. You talked about some of the political and the religious differences. What are the cultural differences between these two regions? There's talk about the dress and the portrait and music and maybe some of those other things. One thing that's interesting that I thought was rendered nicely was the difference in fashions. And they did tend to have their own styles, these places. And I don't know if Ferrara was considered really provincial. I don't think so uh, compared to Florence. Uh, That's something I want to explore a bit further, but everything from hairstyles to gowns and and fabrics and things. We hear about the silk industry and Eleonora di Toledo has her insectarium and Florence is famous for silk weaving. That's not really something that Ferrara is famous for. Ferrara had a university and many poets and philosophers and mathematicians and scientists and things. So it was a really interesting place the culture of Florence seems to have, if I'm not mistaken, really revolved more around the court and academies that built up not so much uh, the university, although there was one. The music is mentioned here. Ferrara was famously interested in music. I guess it would have been the grandfather of Alfonso, had a very famous female choir, a music consort that was widely renowned for its beauty and its skill. There are convents in Ferrara that had famous choirs. Basically, they call them evirati here, but they're castrati. And that that would shock Lucrezia. It's interesting that she's she says she hasn't really heard this music or that she she's not used to hearing music. And, and Florence certainly had a musical scene, and there was even a famous female composer there, I would have thought that she would have been attending concerts at court and that her family would have exposed her to music. She she played music. She learned to play music. So I guess it's just that she had not heard these castrati, these evirati singing. And I guess that's possible. I guess that's possible. But I don't know. I think, you know, maybe O'Farrell just wanted to get that in there and have that kind of uncanny description of them. Something I found sort of surprising and I think not plausible is that Alfonso and Lucrezia get to the court at Ferrara, finally, having left this idyllic villa behind, more or less. And there's no entrance. There's really no pageantry for their entrance. And then it's the sisters who say, we have to throw a party. Right. That party would have been in the works for months. Yeah, he's bringing his wife home. Yeah. Thousands, tens of thousands of people would be coming. They'd be figuring out where they're going to lodge, how much food they're going to make, preparing the banquet halls, borrowing tapestries and things to decorate rooms. You know, they borrow from among the courts to decorate rooms where dignitaries are going to sleep or stay because they didn't have enough to furnish every room. They would move them around within these palaces. But when you have a big event like this, the rooms get used and even the nobles have to open up their homes to house people. And we have lists in some cases of who's staying where, et cetera. So this idea that like, we're going to throw a party. <laughs> yeah, let's get this going. I thought that was kind of fun. It's like, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> That's funny. There is some theater that is playing in connection with the party. And Ferrara was very famous for cultivating theater, especially in the vernacular. Hercule d'Este, who would have been her, i got to go back generations, but the father of Isabella d'Este and Alfonso d'Este, so great-great-grandfather, basically sponsored some of the first and most important performances of Plautus, and then Plautus's comedies, so it, Roman, Latin comedies, and then sponsored translations of them into Italian. Wow. It was a big scene in the 15... 20s, 30s. And so by the 1560s, it would have been very common to have plays even produced and commissioned for their first performance at a wedding, usually comedies, because you're not going to do a tragedy, right? (laughs) (laughs) You did read this book with greater knowledge than 99.99% of readers. (laughs) (laughs) How did you enjoy it as a scholar? Mm. What was your experience reading it? 
I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was wonderful what O'Farrell was able to concretize and make materialize. Some of the things that I loved the most are actually just from my own literary sensibility. Her description, for example, at one point, I think it's after they first get to the palace and Lucrezia sleeps for so long. She's so tired and she wakes up and there's this kind of rewind of everything that's happened. She kind of goes, the carriage ride, the departure, the saying of goodbyes, the arrival at the villa, etc. But then she describes the sort of waking of the palace and all the things that are going on in the castello. I thought that was breathtaking, just brilliant and beautiful. And the description of what it's like to sit for a portrait. Some people really refused to do it. (laughs) After the first one, there's like, no, you're going to make portraits from the other portraits. I'm not doing this again. Um, How she felt confined in her clothing and how awful it was to wear that stuff. What a liberation to take it off. I thought that was beautifully, beautifully rendered. And the anxieties around marriage and sexual intercourse, the intricacies of the treachery of the palace. Well, Lucrezia is told, don't think these people just like you. They're not just your friends. I very much appreciated that. And in fact, it's weird that she only went there with one maid because they always brought ladies in waiting with them, partly because of the language barrier. And her mother's ladies in waitings were all Spanish because that was her mother's native tongue. And this was very common, that they would bring their ladies in waiting. Sometimes they'd bring too many, and uh, some of them would have to be sent home because they got too expensive. But it's weird to me that she didn't really have any. And yes, yes, the fact that she gets given these ladies in waiting from inside the court, of course they're going to be spies. Right. What else would they be? Exactly. I liked that, too. There are so many things that I appreciated here you know, the countryside, the descriptions of the area around Ferrara, the smell of the Arno, all of that stuff. I mean, O'Farrell has obviously breathed deeply, so to speak, of into the paintings and the, the countryside, the landscapes there. She does have a skill of just absolutely immersing you into the environment. Her descriptions, as you mentioned, so powerful. You you feel like you are there sensing what Lucrezia mm-hmm. is sensing, seeing what she is seeing, smelling what yeah, she's smelling. Yeah. It's a very sensual book. It is. Do you talk about the endings? We do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I found that so beautiful and satisfying. It's a counter history, obviously, right. but it's it's a great thought experiment And I absolutely adored that. And the way she covered her tracks by making the face so obliterated and swollen, and nobody gets to see the body. Right. It's really great. She's she's got it. And oh my God, it's just such a liberating thing for the reader and for the student of history to imagine this otherwise. What comes together in all of this is the Crezia's painting and underpainting And the fact that female artists were emerging at this time and had been emerging for decades now, and one of the genres that they were particularly skilled in, some of them were court painters and fantastic, but they were emerging also as miniaturists and still life painters. Because if you were not the daughter of a painter and not able to work in the workshop and get commissions and things, you painted what you could paint. People didn't sit for you Mm -hmm. and you weren't given big commissions, but you painted what you could paint. And so she did these still lives and these, these very small things. Those are coming out at that time. And so it's, it's just a beautiful connecting. Was a beautiful way of thinking she might have escaped what was really a prison that her family Mm -hmm. and then her husband built for her, that she, she could have a life beyond that. Yeah, yeah. And we certainly have evidence of other women who were, say, imprisoned by their brothers. This isn't so far from the the norm in some ways that that part of it couldn't be true. I just don't know exactly for a woman in her position. But yeah, I'm willing to imagine this one. And it's (laughs) great. I have to thank you for prompting me (laughs) to read this because there's so many novels of this kind. And I I do enjoy them, but I kind of set them aside and wait until some moment when I have a reason to read them. And I always get pleasure out of them. But this was 
really delightful. <laughs> Isabella de Este, we've talked about her throughout our talk here. What is your work and involvement with this archive? Mm. So I started by wanting to write a book about her as a letter writer. In a previous book that I'd written about women in the Renaissance, somebody had said to me, you know, the person I was hoping you'd talk about was her. And I didn't. Because I was talking about more rebellious types. I was talking about military women and prostitutes. And oh, said, they're oh more, much more fun, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to write about a princess. I'm not interested in them. <laughs> but I decided to go to the archive and just kind of take a look at this correspondence. And I realized it was enormous. Mm. So I started getting grants and going there and sitting there and reading it. And I thought, I need to write a book about her as a correspondent. And I want to just think about how correspondence worked as a kind of technology for news, as a way of keeping families together, as a voice of the self to project authority, all these things. So I started doing that. And then someone heard a paper of that and said, oh, I'd love it if you did an edition of these letters. And I naively said, oh, I'd love to do that. And I didn't realize that there was no Italian existing edition. I was going to have to work from manuscripts. Wow. That there are 30,000 of these that I'd have to make a selection. So I spent many years, like 20, doing that. And in the end, both things came out. I published 830 of her letters in a translation. I ended up finishing the monograph finally that I started to write. In the meantime, I just kind of got wrapped up in her and the archive director and I really wanted to put that correspondence online. So that became a new project and that has developed into the seed of the digital project that is called IDEA, Isabella d'Este Archive, or we call it IDEA. You can't see those letters right now because they're behind a firewall. We're awaiting permission from the new Italian government to be able to publish them again online. They were out there. We have to renew the agreement. They'll be out. And then we got involved in, well, Isabella d'Este was famous for creating an art space. She had an art collection that was a studiolo, she called it, a study. And you've maybe heard of Renaissance Studioli. There's the Studiolo of Urbino is actually in the Met in New York, the thing has like been transported there so you can go and see it. But there were studies that men had where they would put their stuff and bring people in to show their learning. This is, these are my books. This is my globe. This is my astrolabe, etc. And this is my art. She got it into her head, had she wanted to do one of those. And women had these, but they were usually just portrait galleries for family portraits, or they were maybe prayer rooms or something. They were much more modest. Her mother had one. A few other women had them. She wanted something else. She wanted a statement that would bring people to Mantua to see this thing. So she worked on that with artists, hired the best people, corresponded with artists, and she assembled a collection for which she became famous in the history of art. That collection is dispersed for various reasons, but the major paintings from it are in the Louvre. And then other objects from it are in museums around the world. And we thought we would like to assemble that virtually and recreate that space. So that's another part of the project. And people can see the phase one of that project on the IDEA website. It's called the Virtual Studiolo. And I'm pretty wrapped up in that and the letters project more and more. I'm writing occasional essays. I just finished one on Boccaccio that will be out, you know, on one of Boccaccio's tales, but mostly this is what is capturing my imagination and keeping me busy is working on this for for that site. We're very excited about it. It's fun to be in such a collaborative project working with people. The thing about these digital projects is no one person could do these things no one person has all the skills. So you've got various kinds of programmers, designers, virtual modelers, historians, music people, art historians, and you all have to come together and see what you can build that will do it justice. And what would be fun are meetings that we just had here in Irvine with my Italian team who work out of a supercomputing center in Bologna called Cineca. 
We've been talking about ways to invent learning games to be used to make the collection of both the letters and the virtual studiolo kind of come alive and be accessible for different levels of audience use. That's exciting. We're talking about using artificial intelligence to help us transcribe the letters because there aren't really good tools for transcribing handwritten. There are a few things out there, but we're working on what would be best for us to use. And the thing about the handwritten letters, they have to be in Italian. A transcription tool really looks at the level of the letter. So it kind of doesn't matter what language it's in, but the letters are full of abbreviations because they're handwritten. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out how you're going to work with that. These are technicalities. It's fun to think about. And if we had them all automatically transcribed, what could we do with them? Could we enter into conversation? We we talked about an Isabella bot. Yes. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Your head sort of starts to spin. Yeah. (laughs) It's a very layered work. And the more you've done, the more you are able to draw on. So the fact that we have all these letters online and that we can do things with them gives us a tremendous sense of potential. It would be different from somebody who didn't write as many letters or dictate them, of course, Mm -hmm. or whose letters are more lost. And this is a special case because much of Isabella Deste's correspondence was copied before it was sent out and it was gathered together in copy books. That's how I could read all these outgoing letters because otherwise they would have ended up elsewhere and maybe even destroyed for the most part. Oh, that's fascinating. So the website is the place where people can keep up to date on that project? Yeah, for sure. Right. And that's at www.isabelladeestaarchive.org. And I will put links in the show notes. Great. I'd love to see people visit. You don't have to register or anything to visit. You can go there. We're not interested in gathering anybody's data. The only people who have to register will be if they want to actually provide transcriptions within our archive cache. That'll be later, but anybody can read those. Mm -hmm. I visited the website. It's so interesting. It's extensive. I definitely recommend anyone who is interested in this time period, check this out. This is a bunch of amazing scholars who are working around bringing the life of this woman to us Mm -hmm. in the 21st century. Yeah, it's really fun. And if I could just put in a plug, I really encourage people to look at the film. It's 25 minutes. It's called The Illustrated Credenza. And it's about uh, Renaissance Maiolica, which is a tin glazed earthenware that's often highly decorated. It's partly an interview and a demonstration with an artist who's living today and who is a ceramic artist. And she is recreating those Renaissance plates using the same methods that were used in the Renaissance. And she's adorable. It's subtitled in English. She's wonderful. So take a look at that if you're interested. If you're a museum hound, you may well find the plates from Isabella's collection. You'll certainly, if you visit that part of a museum, you'll find similar things. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us on the front porch. This has been such a wonderful way to delve deeper into the time and place the marriage portrait takes place. I feel like I have a much wider understanding of this time period. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was thoroughly delightful. Oh, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Nancy, my goodness, we found a very knowledgeable person, didn't we? Unbelievable. (laughs) She really was fascinating because now I feel like I understand the book better. I almost wish I would have heard her talk about it first. And then had the knowledge to be able to read and understand the book a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she just was able to tell us so much about what was happening at the time and confirmed so much of what Maggie presents in the book, which tells us this author did very deep research to try to capture the environment, the culture. I thought the differences between the two courts was interesting in the book, but then to have Deanna confirm for us, oh yes, these courts were known for different things. They did have different styles of dress. That deepens my admiration for this book quite a bit. It actually deepened my admiration towards her. Well, that too. He's very knowledgeable. (laughs) 
Oh, we got an expert. All right, Nance. Wow. And don't you love it that she was just meeting with her Italian team in the last couple of days. And so she was able to talk to them about the book and find their opinions on several aspects of the book. I feel like we are getting the deepest, deepest expertise and response to this book than anyone else in the world is going to be able to enjoy. <laughs> Absolutely. My goodness. How fascinating. Well, next month, we are going to talk about The Rabbit Hutch, and it's written by Tess Genty. So I'm excited to read the book. I haven't started it yet, Nance, but I'll be on it. I will be very interested to see what you think about the first chapter. Oh, no. Am I going to cry? <laughs> what? What are you exposing me to now? What am I going to be doing? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no, you're laughing, which means I am going to be upset, aren't I? Uh, let's just say we're going to have plenty to talk about. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I'm probably three quarters of the way through. Very different book set in current times, the United States, lots of different characters. Very interesting. I had an opportunity to completely delve into this book as I sat on the tarmac for five hours. Oh, no trying to leave Denver airport earlier this week. Oh no. Yeah. It's so. horrible. I'm so sorry. It was a very good thing to be doing because you're so powerless in those situations. You can grumble, you can be upset, but that's not going to help anything. So I just opened up my book and started reading. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Okay. Well, Nancy, it's been a joy spending this afternoon with you on the front porch. As always, I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> well, our episodes come out twice a month on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. Our website is frontporchbookclub.com. Definitely stop by. We always have show notes for all the episodes. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter. And if you have a friend who enjoys books, tell them about our podcast. So Nancy... I'll see you next time. All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.